So far, we've seen that Jesus came to demonstrate God's kingdom. Jesus came to reveal the Father. Jesus came to do the Father's will. Jesus came to be a light in darkness. And today, I am absolutely privileged to look at what I think is one of the most misunderstood aspects of why Jesus came, that being that Jesus came to serve and how this is to be our example of servanthood and for leadership. So I'm going to jump straight in and let's just look at a passage from Mark chapter 10, verse 35 to 45. The request of James and John. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to him, Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. What do you want me to do for you? He asked them. They replied, let one of us sit on your right and the other on your left in glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Can you drink the cup I drink or be baptised with the baptism I will be baptised with? Oh, we can, we can, they answered. Jesus said to them, you will drink the cup I drink and be baptised with the baptism I am baptised with. But to sit on my right or my left, that is not for me to grant. Those places belong to whom they have been prepared. Now, when the other ten heard about this, they became indignant, indignant with James and John. Jesus called them together and said, You know that those who are regarded as the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great amongst you must become your servant, and whoever wants to be the first must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. The first thing we need to do is we need to put this passage into a bit of context. Um, the passage comes from Mark's Gospel, the shortest of the four Gospels. And at the beginning of this chapter, at, uh, chapter 9 of Mark, Jesus had finished his public ministry. Jesus is now giving his final detailed teachings to the 12 disciples as they head from Galilee, which was in the country, towards Jerusalem, which was the capital city, which would be Jesus' final destination in about a fortnight's time. So just prior to this, Jesus was at the height of his popularity. Jesus had a large following in the country. And at this stage, however, there was just one group, one group, the religious leaders, they were becoming increasingly frustrated and threatened by Jesus because he was popular with the masses. And they had begun the processes, they had begun the manipulations that would lead to Jesus' death. Jesus had increasingly been giving references or prophecies about his upcoming death. The third of these was given in Mark's gospel just prior to this passage we just read. But these were understood by absolutely no one. Critically, the disciples, the very people who had been teaching intimately for three years, they completely and utterly misunderstood what, is, what was about to happen to Jesus. And they certainly didn't want to hear anything about Jesus' death. In the mind of many people, and probably in the minds of at least some of the disciples, they thought, indeed, they wanted Jesus as their Messiah to become some sort of an earthly political leader of the country. So when we look at the, the active followers of Jesus, there was this outer core of 70 or 72, and then there were the 12 disciples. And in between this outer core and this inner core, there were close families, and there were financial supporters, and there were practical supporters, including, by the way, the sisters and the close relatives of family. But within the 12 disciples, there was actually an inner core that Jesus invested the bulk of his time with. And these three disciples are James, John and Peter. They formed actually an inner core of, in, in, of, of the 12. And in John's gospel, he records that James and John, uh, John was the writer himself, with Andrew and Peter are the first four disciples. So it's highly probable that those four... Uh, James, John and Peter and, and Andrew, they knew each other before Jesus had called them three years prior and they were probably fishermen together. Mark records that James gave James and John the nickname the Sons of Thunder. And I think that this was actually an affectionate term because James and John, they, they said it the way that they saw it. 
Um, Luke has a beautiful passage, um, you know, when they're going through a Samaritan village, you know, and the, 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 uh, the locals were rude to them. And so James and John, they don't hold back. They just simply said, Lord, do you want us to call down fire from heaven to destroy them? You know, do you want to call in a, a, an airstrike? You know, it's a command that Jesus rebukes. James, John and Peter, they were with Jesus when he was supernaturally raised, uh, the daughter of Jairus. James, John and Peter, they were with Jesus when he was supernaturally appeared or he transfigured with the two greats of the Old Testament, Moses and Elijah. And John, six times in his gospel, he makes reference to his closeness to Jesus. And in just after these events, Jesus sends Peter and John to go ahead and to prepare the final Passover or meal that they all had together. And in a fortnight or so's time after this incident, it was John and it was only John of all the male disciples who stayed with Jesus as he died on the cross. And whilst dying, Jesus entrusted to John the care of his earthly mother, Mary, who at that stage we assume was a widow. So back to the passage. So the brothers, James, John, who were there at the very beginning, they were a part of the innermost core of the followers. They'd be doing some thinking. James and John decided to make a run for it. They decided to cement their personal power and role in whatever Jesus was establishing. And so in this passage, all of their misunderstandings about Jesus, all of their misunderstandings about God's plan or for the Messiah, they just all bubble to the surface. Everything about their misunderstandings bubble, including their misunderstandings about leadership. And so James and John ask what is frankly a selfish, self-absorbed request of Jesus. They wanted Jesus to be their puppet leader to satisfy their selfish ones. They actually had the audacity, the audacity in verse 35, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask. All James and John were thinking about that stage was themselves. There was no humility in their request. It was absolutely self-centred. And so Jesus does allow this request, which is all about this jostling for power and control. Because in their thinking, leadership meant power. James and John were thinking about leadership no different than the popular understandings of leadership of a day. At that time when Jesus lived and when he had taught, they were a part of a Roman Empire. And Rome was at its historic height at this time. And Rome was the mightiest empire that at its time and arguably it's ever been because Rome knew how to organise unified, disciplined, trained, repressive armies and they were led by powerful, single-minded leaders who knew how to organise these repressive armies. And so James and John's thinking was actually no different to that of the Romans who were occupying the, the country at the time. So James and John, they specifically asked to be on the right and on the left, which is a coded way of saying we want to be the second and third in command. It's exactly what you would have if you had political or military leaders. And so Jesus tips upside down everything that they thought they knew about why he came. The nature of power that he sought and the model of leadership which God demands. Jesus tips everything upside down. So Jesus made yet another reference to his upcoming death and their suffering. There's a bit of an analogy here. The cup is an Old Testament analogy towards suffering. Baptism is an analogy to death and resurrection. And so they just give this naive response. Oh, you know, we can, we can. Um, Little did they know that James would be one of the first disciples to be martyred. John was actually probably one of a few disciples to to live out old age and we we are grateful for that because we have his gospel. But the exchange doesn't end there. The other ten disciples, they all chip in and all these group tensions, they just bubble along to the surface, you know. They're all annoyed with James and John that they had put up their hands for the plum jobs. You know, what about me? What about me? So Jesus sets them straight. Whoever wants to be great amongst you must be your servant and whoever wants to be the first must be the slave of all for even the son of man did not come to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many following jesus is not the same as worldly leadership 
Following Jesus is not about lording over other people. Following Jesus is not about coercion. Following Jesus is not about repression. Following Jesus is not about the misuse of power. At the heart of godly or Jesus' leadership is servanthood. Jesus' leadership is about servanthood. It is about humility. It is about service. And Christians are called to imitate Christ and to lead as Jesus would lead. About a week or so after these events of this passage, Jesus entered Jerusalem in triumph, being celebrated as a king. And just one week after that, we come to our next passage, which we're about to read. So Jesus is alone in a room with his disciples, celebrating what would be their last meal together. Jesus does something absolutely astonishing. He got up from the meal, he took off his outer clothing, wrapped a towel around his waist, and after that he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you do not realise now what I am doing, but later you will understand. No, no, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part in me. This passage, it has enormous gravity, enormous gravitas that is lost on, on modern readers. And I think the passage often gets overlooked in the light of a death of Christ that occurs the following day. Firstly, the disciples, uh, sorry, Jesus and the disciples, they had arrived into the capital city, into Jerusalem, to celebrate the most important feast on the religious calendar. And it's that feast that miraculously remembered the, the miraculous salvation, the miraculous exodus, the exodus that God had provided 1,400 years ago for the people of Israel from Egypt. And critical to that was they did this by splashing lamb's blood around their doors. And that was what saved them from the angel of death. And that is something that Jesus was about to repeat the next day. And so let's just get this perfectly straight. The Passover wasn't just a meal. It wasn't just a good family time. It was a religious reminder of God acting in history. And so like all good Jews, all of them needed to be ceremonially clean to partake in the meal, in this feast. And there's a second dynamic, which is this. The Middle East was a dusty, dirty place. 2,000 years ago, there was no sewage systems. Human waste was thrown into the streets. Donkeys and animals, they would defecate on the streets and on the roads as the people walked around. Most people probably walked around barefoot, and at best they had very simple open sandals. And their feet would have been dirty with the dust and with the excrement. And so upon arriving into a home, if you were wealthy, you would have your most junior slave to wash your feet and the feet of your guests, to remove that dust, to remove that dirt, to remove that street excrement in this era before sewerage systems. And that slave was the lowest slave of the household. And that slave's second duty, by the way, was also to remove the human waste bucket from inside the house because there were no toilets. And so as the disciples, as Jesus, as they come into the final room, they have no slave, okay? They, they have nobody to greet them and to wash their dirty feet. And so Jesus shocks all of them by taking on this role. Jesus took on the role of the lowest, lowest, lowest slave. It is Jesus who removes the dirt, who removes the acrement on their smelly, rough, worn feet. And when he had finished washing their feet, sorry, next slide, when he had finished washing their feet, he put on his clothes and returned to his place. Do you understand what I have done for you? He asked them. You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your teacher and Lord, have washed your feet, you also should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example 
that you should do as I have done for you. Very truly I tell you, no servant is greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you do them. Jesus, as the leader, he didn't order somebody else to do his most menial work. Jesus, as the leader, did the most menial, dirty task possible. And this is the example. This is the command of Jesus. And this is our example as followers of how we should love and we should treat one another. This is Jesus' example of leadership. Not thinking of ourselves too important. Too important to do the dirty work and to do a gross job that needs to be done. And the events of this incident occurred on the Thursday night and give us a foretaste of what Jesus achieved on the cross when he died by the afternoon of the next day. For there was no sin, there is no sin, no excrement that we have that is not cleaned through the power of a cross. I've been a Christian for a few years now and I've come to the realisation that the health or the vitality of Christian churches directly reflects how well the formal leadership and indeed, and indeed the entire congregation understand about Jesus-centred leadership. As Christians, we have been called to have a distinctively Christ-centred approach to leadership. The church is called to be a living body that continues to live and breathe Christ on this earth. And the way we do this, the way we organise ourselves, the, everything we do is to be distinctively Christ-focused. The world values leadership built on the power of the individual. It's all about who controls the most, who gets the most, who has their ego stroke the most, who climbs the, the greasy pole the highest. Who's got the office in the top of the very top building? That's the world's definition of leadership. For Jesus, leadership is built on humility and on servanthood. It is the exact opposite of a secular or corporate or political or military understanding of leadership, which ultimately is a backstabbing scramble to the top of the hierarchy. One thing is really critical that I really want to strongly say here. It is critical to note that Jesus does not condemn leadership per, per se. Leadership isn't the problem. The problem is a leadership which isn't Christ-centred. For Jesus, leadership is about humility and service. For Jesus, leadership is about teamwork. For, lead, for Jesus, leadership is about releasing people to exercise their gifts for the good of a whole body. And for Jesus, leadership is ultimately about building the kingdom. And this isn't a message just for the pastors or for the elders. Leadership is something that all of us Christians, we need to grow in and to exercise. In its simplest form, leadership is influence. Leadership is influence. That is actually the definition of leadership. You can either be a positive influence on other people's lives or you can be a negative influence. You don't need to say or even intentionally influence another person to be their leader. Leadership can either be positive, you can positively influence somebody, or indeed you could be negative, you can indeed you could mislead somebody. And ultimately, the whole aim of the gospel, it centres around leadership. It centres around influencing people for the gospel. As Christians, we are called to be positive leaders in our world. This is what the church is called to do. The church is called to lead. Think about the Great Commission, which is a summary statement of our action plan, our mandate for the, for the church. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptising them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. This is a leadership statement. It's about positively influencing people to change their beliefs and make right actions and right behaviour. Parents. I think I've got a few parents in the room. You are leaders. You've been given a gift of one or two or three and after the baby was born, then the placenta came and then the instruction manual came. With that instruction manual, it clearly says that 
the, the whole aim of being a parent is that in two decades time you have a fully functioning, independent, productive, Christ focused adult. That's actually the aim of parenting. Parenting is about leadership. So everyone in this room is a leader, it's just that we have different responsibilities. Some people are called to a specific leadership role, okay? So some people are called to a specific leadership role. That is, they have a responsibility for a specific area or responsibility that, affects, that reflects their gifting, that reflects their passion, that reflects their qualifications, that reflects their experience and their particular calling. But all of us, all Christians, are called to be a part of a general form of Christian leadership. That is to be a positive influence for the world, for the gospel, and to build ourselves as an example on the example of Christ. Indeed, growing as a leader is the responsibility of all Christians. So growing as a leader is the responsibility of all Christians. All Christians are called into community, the church, to discover, to develop our gifting, our passions, our qualifications, our experience, so that we can exercise leadership responsibilities and build up the church. But there's one other ingredient which is compulsory into this mix. It's actually the fuel that ignites gifting. It ignites the passion, it ignites the qualification, it ignites the experience. Jesus spent three years investing his time with a core group of 12 leaders who would ultimately go on to change world history. Do you want to know something? They weren't particularly inspiring people. I have a confession to make. If ever they came to me and asked me for a job, I don't think I'd give any of them a job. They were fairly uninspiring people. As the events right up to the death of Jesus showed, they completely and utterly misunderstood what Jesus was, uh, was about. So what changed? What changed is that they encountered the resurrection, resurrected Jesus and they were empowered by the Holy Spirit. The fundamental ingredient that changes everything is Easter Sunday. It's Resurrection Sunday. So what is your attitude towards leadership? Is it about selfishness? Is it about service? Where is God leaving you to exercise your gifts, your experiences, your abilities, your qualifications? Where is God leading you? What are you going to do to become a better leader? Where in this church or the church broader than here is God leading you into leadership? What is the next step? What are you going to do about it? What is your next step? Let us pray. Lord Jesus, we confess that we fail in our task to be a leader for you. Lord Jesus, help us to grow as the leaders that you intend. Help us to grow in our service. Help us to grow in our humility. Help us to know and to grow in our gifting, our passion, our qualifications and our experiences. Lord, help us to use these to build up your church. Lord, help us to be fueled by the power of your resurrection and by the power of the Holy Spirit. And thank you for what you achieved for us on the cross. Amen.